So now it's time for our second speaker, Christian Pareno. Christian is a professor at University of San Francisco de Cuero in Ecuador. And Christian is the title of Christian's paper is Boredom in the Architecture of Will Alsop. If I don't know if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. So as usual, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat box and uh, we'll get to them later. And now I'll turn it over to Christian. Thank you. I'm going to share my presentation. In the history of modern architecture, boredom has been an influential force, an omnipresence that nonetheless has been mostly kept concealed and abated. Very few architects have referred to it. Le Corbusier, the doyen of modernist architecture, during his early encounters with the discipline, complained of suffering boredom. In a letter to his parents of 1910, he described his emotions as an intern in the studio of Peter Behrens. He wrote, each day begins by opening a big hole in front of me and dropping me into it because I thought I wasn't being an idiot, which I am, and in a way that's disgustingly and unacceptably unfair. Of course, it's my own fault, but my sickness is right there, mocking me, frustrating me. It's all summed up in a single word of two syllables, boredom. Also during the condition, Philip Johnson, an architect known for his always changing style, from modernism to postmodernism and even deconstructivism, declared in 1996, when he turned 90, that the drive behind all his architectural work was a desire to be famous and a hatred for boredom. He admitted that the search for the interesting and exciting turned into an addiction to battle the interminable boredom of bourgeois culture. More extremely, Peter Cook has stated that all his efforts in life as well as in architecture have been directed to avoid boredom, an awful and despicable state that should not even be mentioned. In 1999, reflecting on the origins of Archigram, an avant-garde group, he wrote that, in the late 1960s, a loose group of people started to meet, to criticize projects, to concoct letters to the press, to combine to make a competition project, and generally prop one another up against the boredom of working in London architectural offices. When I asked him in 2014 if that initial boredom was a reaction against the type of architecture they had to produce as employees of impersonal studios, or against activities of producing architecture, extensive hours of uncredited and monotonous drafting, he replied, I hate the architectural position that edifies boredom, which says this is right or this is good. It is a kind of puritanism. It reminds me of Scottish Presbyterians, or people who wear natural fiber sandals or eat brown rice. In my mind, boredom goes with all that is tedious, too good, politically correct, healthy food, don't do anything naughty, don't speak too loudly. To all that stuff, I say, fuck them. An exception to this constant avoidance, Will also admitted to actively embrace boredom as a force of not only creation, but also of enlightenment. A source of knowledge. But his projects are neither grey nor monotonous nor related to any of the typical associations to what is usually assumed as boring. They are rather playful, irreverent and colourful, appearing as urban presences demanding attention, with original spatial arrangements that require clever engineering. When he died in 2018, after a short illness, all obituaries highlighted his creativity, calling him a maverick. The New York Times portrayed him as an architectural provocateur who believed that architecture ought to brighten landscapes and that architects had a calling to inspire others while having fun with their work. 
For instance, the Beckham Library in Southeast London has the shape of an upside down capital L, creating an overhang supported by seven slanted pillars. One face of the library has colorful glass, the others are clad in pre-patinated copper, and the roof is topped by what looks like a giant orange beret. For this design, he won the 2000 Sterling Prize, Britain's most prestigious architectural award. The magazine wallpaper uh, noted that his way, his was always an architectural spectacle, adrift in an era of sober conformity, too ostentatious for the modernists, too bold for the high-tech crowd, and too wayward and not conformist for the post-modernists. The Sharp Center for Design and Okada University, Julian's institution actually, is composed of a two-floor slab for classes and offices, covered in a crossword puzzle-like pattern of corrugated black and white metal squares, and perched it nine stories above the ground, partly over an existing building, supported by a dozen lean angled pillars of different colors. When this project won the annual award of the Royal Institute of British Architects in 2004, the jury described it as courageous and just a little insane. In its tribute, the Guardian called his visions wild and wacky, which were often too harebrained for reality to bear, quoting also for himself when he said that architects are the only profession that actually deal in joy and delight. All the others deal in doom and gloom. When he began working on a series of visioning studies for post-industrial northern cities that were looking for a wow factor to put themselves on the map, he proposed to turn Barnsley into a Tuscan hill town surrounded by a living wall of glowing novelty forms. He flooded the center of Bradford with a huge lake and wanted to adorn Middlesbrough with towers in the shape of Brad skirts. This last plan, which would have costed 500 million pounds, included a shimmering hotel in the shape of a champagne bottle and an office block model on Marge Simpson's hairdo. The Guardian added, he was a mischievous breath of fresh air injecting a welcome dose of color and energy into a profession that was all too beige, particularly amidst the neo-modernism and minimalism that characterized the beginning of the 21st century. In addition, also was a keen painter. Kate Woodwin, former curator of the Royal Academy, noted that he was known for blurring the boundaries between art and architecture. She wrote that also was only interested in boundaries in order to erode them, creating a space, physically and metaphorically, where art, architecture and life would coexist. He would use painting as an integral part of the design process, helping to explore the ideas which would find their way into forms. Yet behind all this creativity and sprightly mood, boredom was the method, or the non-method, the anti-method of his production. In 2012, also examined the dialectic between boredom and creativity in an event titled The Glorious Potential of Boredom, organized by the School of Life, an institution run by Alain de Botton in London. Marketed as a Sunday secular sermon, the lecture commenced with the premise that boredom morphs into creation and inventiveness when there is sufficient time to do nothing and not to worry about it. To also, the condition was the positive symptom of a social, political, and economic structure that provides spaces where people are happy to sit and do nothing. To him, boredom escaped negative when it is experienced as free time without pending preoccupations. Architecture thus ought to conspire with society to achieve this goal. If boredom is achieved, then society is doing something right. Illustrated by himself painting while talking during the event, 
also perfume that waiting is rewarding. He said, when you are forced just to sit and look, new possibilities start to appear. Contrarily, the modern anxiety with busyness is incapable of providing spaces for reflection and imagination, risking the dullness of an uncreative life since the paint never dries and we make a muddy mire. In 2017, six months before his death, I interviewed him in his studio in East London. During an hour and some wine, he mused about boredom from his personal stance, always returning to his use as a drive for creation at the beginning of the design process. When a new idea needs to be identified, to him, it was about putting oneself in the liberated places of potential border. With this, on the one hand, he recognized the relational quality of boredom. He confessed that his favorite places for boredom were the kitchen of his house during the weekends, in the mornings, and his studio, built in his garden during the weekdays. On the other hand, he echoed Martin Heidegger's affirmation that one must let boredom be awake, since it is always there, so one can hear what it has to say. This consolidated rituals. In his studio, he had all the materials needed, paint, brushes, pencils and pens, and large sheets of paper. He used to go there between 10 and 10.30. He sat there, waiting, sometimes doodling, sometimes scribbling. By 12.30, he had done nothing. His wife used to call him, saying that lunch would be ready at one. Faced with this interruption, his reaction was of annoyance. He confessed, thinking, damn her, I'm not gonna enjoy lunch. I'm gonna have to put something on this bit of page before I leave and go back to the house. He continued, but then, because of the irritation, you realize that you've actually been thinking all this stuff and it all comes out. All that happened is that you were afraid to make the first mark. You can sit there and do nothing, and then things occur. And it might be a propose something you're working on, it might be a propose nothing. And if you're lucky, you'll see something. You'll find something which is interesting or something that's new to you. Maybe it's not new in the world, but a personal new understanding or a new sort of image. It's an external thing, a pressure that comes from the structure of the day and makes you think, I have to do this. I skip lunch and I find myself sitting there at 2 p.m., ignoring my wife's calls. It's a combination of pleasure and panic when that happens. Because first you feel, I've done nothing. Then you feel, I have found something that might not have been there had I have not taken the time. He compared this ritual of place and time, of repetitious action, to fishing. He said, sometimes you catch a fish, sometimes you don't. But you are rewarded for going fishing. At the road and the beautiful river or lake in the summertime, I believe, are just instruments. You don't really need the road. The road is giving you the license to sit by the, uh, by the side of a piece of water for three hours. As part of the requirements needed for boredom, sitting as a mode of individual and political practice related to the body and its architecture has to be procured. To him, sitting was a logical need that the city ought to offer to its citizens, a mode of caring he paraphrased the argument of a lecture delivered in 2005 at the Royal Institute of British Architects. In that event, he affirmed that an important part of all learning environments, or indeed any working environments, are places to do nothing. Even in our public spaces, have you noticed, it's as though we're almost uh, obliged to do something all the time. Now Winnie the Pooh would have never had that. Sometimes I sit and think, and sometimes I just sit. In our conversation, he expanded. More and more people are living longer and longer, and you want to persuade them to leave their house and just go for a walk. 
then they get tired or they just want to sit and enjoy looking at the world passing by. They have to be able to sit and do nothing. Sitting and doing nothing allows the world to enter into your head. That's where everything starts, usually in your head. I wonder if this ideal is scenario for thinking, sitting without preoccupations, was pleasurable or filled with anxiety, and by extension, if what also was describing was boredom. When I asked him about this, he said that his boredom for creation was not contentment and that it was not despair. He affirmed that his boredom was pleasurable as long as it is deliberate and as long as something has been created. And that capacity to innovate, rather than only design with what is already known, was to also the real task of the architect, what differentiates good from bad architecture. He said, but architects are generally what we might call commercial architects. Their whole point is they don't charge such a high fee and therefore they can't afford to go backward and they have to keep moving forward. And there is no art in what they do. It's just building, not architecture. To conclude, Ossop's elaborations on boredom were intuitive, highlighting the individual experience as a valid source of knowledge, particularly if that knowledge leads to creation. Within architecture, his appropriation of boredom constitutes a rebellious position against academia and official methods of design that, since the early 20th century, have focused around rationalism, functionalism, and the Hegelian belief that the built environment is a representation of concepts. Importantly, through boredom, also pose, also pose architecture as a practice of not only a space, but also of time. A time-space condition that the architect has the responsibility to organize. In this sense, his boredom resonates with the moment of vision articulated by Heidegger. The revelation of boredom permits the reconsideration of the environment, of architecture, as a point of entry into other realms, ontological and political, profound and opposed to the superficiality of the modern everyday life. However, Ossop's boredom, which he portrayed idealistically, perfect in its creative potential, also poses interrogations. First, regarding socioeconomic factors, can the boredom of creativity arise or be induced when the individual has not resolved urgent needs, particularly that of home? Does his boredom therefore carry an elitism that betray its positive intentions? And second, regarding the ideation of architecture, can the design of the built environment anticipate the inhabitants' emotions and be successful in producing certain reactions? Taking into account the flamboyancy of his architecture, of the abundance of elements, colors, texture, materials, shapes, is this a stimuli ideal for reflection, for the boredom he procured? Thank you. Um, thank you for this presentation. Um, we have one question in the chat. It's from Josefa and she asks, can boredom be pleasurable? Is this really boredom? This was not, was not in fact a, oh, a okay. I was just thinking no doubt. <laughs> yeah, but I'll just still posit it because it seems to like... Uh, we, we can take it uh, as a question. <laughs> you want to, Christian. <laughs> Very nice to see you. Thank you. Um, I think it's a very good question, and I think this is something that, to me, keeps sort of uh, uh, repeating in my head when I think about Will also, because he portrayed it so perfect, so nice, so productive, and even in our conversation, it, it was as he was trying to sell me the boredom as something so good and so ideal. And on the other hand, uh, 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 we also tend to associate boredom with with a painful, unwanted experience. So 
I'm not really sure if if what he called boredom is what the rest would call boredom. <laughs> but at least it's a version of boredom. It's, 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 <laughs> it, it is some way of approaching it or perhaps terming his way of thinking ideas through architecture. And the practice of architecture is usually characterized by high velocity, by having to do things in a very uh, a, a high paced manner. But he refused that. And perhaps just by changing the pace, the term that he found to describe his approach was boredom. All, all this sounds to me sounds to me as a sort of romanticization of boredom. <laughs> In I, some think, way. I think that it was romanticization, but it was also a sort of self-validation. When I talked to him, this was six months before his death, oh. uh, I don't know, perhaps he was simply trying to validate all his work and saying, yes, through this approach to boredom, through this slow approach to architecture, I am sort of validating my whole body of work. So it was very romantic, but I think that it was romantic not in the sense of wanting to romanticize boredom, but in the sense of self-validating his own efforts in architecture. Oh, interesting. Interesting. I was also thinking, and I, I, I type it in, in the chat box, uh, concerning this part in which you explain that the necessity of, what to say, of spend time doing nothing for, for creativity to flourish. And I always remember the the same by Pablo Picasso, muses visit me when I'm working and busy. So I don't know. I I have contradictory feelings concerning <laughs> this idea. I I I totally agree. And um, um but actually yesterday I met with one of his former um associates and he told me two very interesting anecdotes. Anecdote number one was that he used to have in his office some sort of chair, like a chaise longue, uh -huh. that when they were working together and he would get so sort of, uh, um, so let's say uh, obfuscated by too much information, he would stop and take a nap, literally to switch <laughs> off his brain and 20 minutes later he would rejoin the uh, meeting. And another interesting anecdote is that he hired one guy to do nothing. A former student whom he considered very, uh, very talented. He hired him just to be around the office and not having to do anything, just coming up with things, with ideas out of his observation of what was going on around the studio. So Yes, it's it's a different version of boredom. Uh, of boredom. Perhaps it's an in instrumentalization yeah. that he called it like that. Wow, interesting. Uh, I'm gonna stop talking because there are <laughs> some other questions on in the chat box. Thank you, Christian. Um, yes, we have one question from Julian, and he asks, also seems to reflect a lot of the approach I see in Shigeru Ben's architecture, the desire to not just build. How do you feel this relates to his practice? Um, I think that, uh, well, they are very different practices, particularly in the sense that Shigeru Ben, uh, uh, he claims not to be interested in architecture as a sort of personal expression. Um, it is more about society, it's about a more culture, it's about reaching some sort of, let's say, a balance among the members and, and inhabitants of his architecture. While Will also definitely was about using architecture as an expression of his own being. And I think that within that relationship, I think that it's 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 way perhaps uh, more sort of uh, coherent 
the sort of approach of boredom in the sense of will also, despite his architecture was not boring, was exactly the opposite of that, because it is a sort of perhaps a, a manifestation of his own being through boredom, perhaps going deep in order to try to gain any understanding, but from a personal position, while Shigeru Ban is definitely about culture and society, or at least that's how he positions himself. Thank you. Sorry, you are mute? Yeah, sorry. Okay, we have one comment from Annie. Um, it sounded like Will also had an idea of boredom that was very utopian, and I get the feel his architecture also aimed at a very fantastical, playful utopia. Yes. Uh, I think it also, and perhaps this is part of my critique or, or, or what allows me to understand a little bit better his position, is that he was very uh, active within this school of life, which I don't know if you are familiar with. The school of life is this sort of institution run by Alain de Bottom, the philosopher, and and philosopher and very successful writer. He has this book called The Architecture of Happiness. And in The Architecture of Happiness, he portrays, he projects different architectures of what he called happiness, but he begins his book by assuming that the individual, the person, the user of architecture, has resolved all their needs. Uh, that therefore be, becomes a very specific project for a very sort of specific audience uh, within even the British society. So I think that will also, also has to be sort of understood, or perhaps we should approach his work through those sort of eyes. And trying to uh, uh, understand and critique this position, which in a way portrays, perhaps as Josefa said, this very romanticized version of boredom. Uh, I think at some moments as some sort of marketing strategy, but perhaps as a more sort of center condition in which the architect, the artist, takes himself, his experience as point of beginning. Well, um, 